Hey, my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? We're coming to you from just outside Chicago, Illinois, and I thought, you know, one of the most famous names in Chicago history and organized crime history is Alphonse Capone, Al Capone. So let's go visit his grave today. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Looks like it is right up here. Here we are at Mount Carmel Cemetery. How appropriate. It's actually very easy to find right when you first come in. Definitely not somebody I would say I'm a fan of, but uh, I guess a very fascinating person because look at all the Capones out here. Major family plot here. This was not his first burial spot. It was actually a Mount Olive. You can see here his father Gabriel, his mother Teresa, here he is, three years after Al died they moved him and his brother and his father over to here and then the whole family and there's a lot of mobsters over here. Al Capone was actually born and raised in Brooklyn. That's where he got his start. He was actually a very smart person, but uh, when he went to school, as you might imagine, he um, even though he was intelligent, he didn't like to be told what to do. And it wasn't very long, I think he was 13 or 14 years old before he was kicked out of school for striking one of his female teachers so at the age of 14 he was on the streets had joined several gangs he was in all of the major gangs all over new york the five points gang in manhattan and eventually befriended people that were higher up he uh, a man named johnny torrio he used or looked at as a uh, guidance but al would Originally start out being kind of a bouncer and a bartender and uh, working his way into the Mafia Also tried to promote boxing gigs Little legitimacy behind what else he was doing, but it was actually his time in New York When he was working at Coney Island. He was uh, a bouncer there that he ended up getting the name Scarface Al did have a girlfriend. His girlfriend was a couple years older than him, but uh, Al liked the women a lot. And while he was a bouncer, he saw a woman with a pretty nice posterior and made a comment about it. And uh, apparently her boyfriend was heavily connected in an opposing gang and uh, they were both drunk and he came after Al and left that scar on the side of his face. Al would always be paranoid about it. He would, when he would take photos, he would take photos with the other side so that you couldn't see it. But basically what ended up happening is that the mafia heads found out about it, got together and said, you know, basically between the two of you, you got to squash this because we don't want this to prolong or to be something that there's retribution later. And Al actually agreed to do that because he said when he looked at it, um, in the end, he was actually wrong. And that, that, that the guy was actually defending his sister. So it was actually a noble thing to do and Al couldn't blame him. But I believe it was a little after this time, Al would be 19 years old and he would find out that his girlfriend had become pregnant by Al. And so he and his girlfriend May decided to get married, but Al wasn't old enough yet. He was 19, so his parents Teresa and Gabriel had to sign the form to give him permission. So they ended up getting married, having the baby. And well, they actually had the baby, I believe first and then got married. And then Al was asked to go to Chicago and help the organized crime in Chicago. So he went there and it was, it seems like there was a, you know, there was a 
north side gang south side gang and there was there was a rift between the two and right when al got there in the early 19 1919 1920 right after that is when prohibition came in so the mafia saw a big opportunity to make a lot of money and they did <laughs> they started bootlegging and started doing prostitution and speakeasies and were muscling in to force businesses to buy things buy alcohol from them buy protection from them or else they would have bad accidents things like that and then eventually the north side gang was stealing they were like basically robbing the shipments of the south side gang and so that was really ramping up this war during prohibition and so the south side boss decided to retire and Johnny Torrio, who Al had looked at as a mentor, took over. And eventually there was a major assassination attempt on him. So he decided to leave and left, the, left everything to Al. And Al took over. And Al was pretty ruthless. Um, you know, he was heavily involved in all of the things that they'd been making money f with before, which was the bootlegging, the speakeasies, and especially the prostitution. And the man who was in charge of the Northside gang, Bugs, was a heavy Catholic and hated the fact that Capone was making money off of prostitution. He found that to be like an immoral way of doing it. So that even ramped up what they hated about each other even more. And so Al ended up moving the whole operation to Cicero and basically was buying off not only the politicians in Cicero, but he was using a lot of the money that he was making to open soup kitchens and to help people less fortunate. So he was looking like a good guy to the community. He was paying off the politicians so he could pretty much do whatever he wanted and just run amok a crime spree. Now, there was one year, I think it was 1924, that they were looking at possibly having some trouble because the Republican mayor of Cicero, there was gonna be opposition this time. He had been there for three terms, basically allowed Al and all the gangs to do whatever they wanted. And now it was looking like he might possibly lose and that the Democratic Party wanted to clean up Cicero. So Al and his gang, including his brother who worked for him, they went out and to all the polling places, anyone that was running for office, they wreaked havoc on Cicero. If they found someone that had either voted against one of their guys, they would pistol whip them, they would beat them, they would, uh, some people they found um, that were going to vote against them, they kidnapped them and chained them to the basement of a hotel that the Southside gang ran, uh, other, people that were running against people that Al had paid off. They went and kidnapped them. They shot him in the knee, shot him in the legs, shot him in the feet. They did this all over Cicero. And somehow some of the people that they had chained up downstairs had gotten to a phone, called the judge, and the judge sent 70 police officers and detectives to Cicero to find out what was going on. A massive shootout ensued. Al ended up getting away unharmed, but his brother got killed. And that was kind of what started putting Al on the map as being where the police were kind of starting to get involved in not letting him do everything that he wanted the way he wanted. This was kind of the beginning of his downfall. And also Al had came up with a plan to attack the North side. And basically what he did was he offered them a good price, not him personally, but through an informant, they offered a good price to the North side for an alcohol shipment. And then when it was supposed to happen, they had the police come and do a raid on those guys, but they weren't actually police. Some of them were police and some were gangsters. And that was the St. Valentine's Day shootout. So one thing that Al always battled was I mentioned that he had been married. That was actually surprisingly a marriage that lasted his entire life. Even though I mentioned he loved women 
and would run brothels and things like that and would partake, he ended up getting syphilis and gonorrhea through that. His wife stayed with him and uh, those were things that would eventually end up plaguing the rest of his life. So the government was having trouble really getting anything to stick with Al, mainly because um, the way he ran the mafia, even though he liked to live large and dress nice and eat good foods and buy expensive jewelry and everything, he didn't really leave much of a paper trail. He didn't uh, put his name on the ownership of his homes. Uh, he didn't have any bank accounts when he did anything. It went through Western Union, things like that. So it was a little bit difficult, but what they tried to do was go after him for tax evasion. And uh, originally he did end up in prison for a year in Philadelphia. Um, it was a kind of a thing that he agreed to plead guilty on in lieu of other charges. They had found a gun on his person, a concealed weapon, and so he basically had done a plea to agree to serve a year in Philadelphia and it was a really posh setup. He had like really nice furniture and, in, and everything in there. But when he ended up going to Alcatraz and everything later, it was not so nice. The United States government started the Untouchables, basically. There was a group of men who were out to find a way to break up Al Capone's organization. They would go and they would tap his phone. They would find out when deliveries were going to be and they would break up the route to the delivery costing him millions of dollars and then the government basically you know like i said went after him for the taxes his lawyer had admitted that al had like a hundred thousand dollars of taxable income from the year before when they asked and just by him saying that turned out to be an admission that was usable in court stating that he was working under the table earning money and so when they started to track it back, they found out that he was making $10 million in his organizations. He personally was getting like a million dollars a year. So they came after him for that. He worked out a plea deal. So his, his lawyers didn't really have to come up with much of a defense. They had worked out a plea deal with the prosecution. And so Al was just gonna serve two and a half years, but when they went in and presented the plea deal in front of the judge, the judge refused it and ended up not only hitting Al Capone with, I believe 11 and a half years, but also contempt of court for pretending to be sick and postponing all the trials and everything. So he was sentenced to serve all that time in federal prison, as well as once he would get out, he would have to then serve all the contempt charges in the time that he was given there. So he originally went to jail and apparently he was getting bullied in jail. He was getting attacked. He was getting, it was just a real bad situation. And some of the um, prisoners felt like he got special treatment, which was also bad for him. So they decided to move him all the way out to Alcatraz. Like I mentioned, he ended up at Alcatraz when Alcatraz was new and he ended up moving into a room there. But as I mentioned before, he had contracted syphilis and gonorrhea. And if he would have treated them when he first got them, he probably would have been okay, but he didn't. And so they really started to affect him really badly. In fact, the last year of his time in Alcatraz, he was in the infirmary and he was looked at by a doctor and they said, basically from that time till the end of his life, he had the mental capacity of a 12 year old. So his wife, who had stuck by him through everything, petitioned to the court to get him released or hoping to get him released early because of his health. And they declined that, but uh, he did eventually get out and then was sent to a prison on the coast of California again to fulfill the rest of his sentence for the contempt. And then when he came out, he attempted to go into be treated in Maryland. And the first place that he went absolutely refused to treat him. So he found another place that treated him. And then he eventually came home and basically, which in his home at that time was uh, Miami. 
He basically came home and his wife took care of him and he had a plethora of illnesses at the end, pneumonia, uh, I believe that led to a uh, heart failure was the, uh, the official cause in the end. This guy is known in pop culture. I mean, you hear the word, the name Scarface, that came from him. Untouchables, the movie, I mean, it's, it's all him. When you think of Mafia, you think of the name Capone. Hard to believe that the guy was lucky enough to find a woman that would stand by him through all the carousing and everything that he did in his life. I guess there's somebody out there for everyone. Grave of Al Capone. That's it, my friends. The Grave of Al Capone. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. We will see you all next time from somewhere in Chicago. Have a great night and goodbye.